Hello, my name is Franklin Joyce, and this is my metaphysics midterm examination video thingamajig. Also, incidentally, if I can track coronavirus and die, this is also my last will and testament. Peace out. Anyway, so I'm going to be discussing a few different things, going over some topics that we've covered in the course of our lecture, our, our um, class so far this year. First thing that I want to touch on is monism, but to understand monism, you're going to need a little bit of a background into individuality. So it's difficult sometimes to explain exactly what an individual thing is, but we can say some things an individual thing is not. So for instance, we can say an individual thing is not a modification of something else. Uh, it's not a collection of individual things. So for instance, um, the US Army of 1935 is a collection of individual things, not an individual thing in and of itself. Uh, individual things are not stuff. So like water, oxygen, sealing wax, all of those would be considered stuff, not individual things. An individual thing is not a universal, which is kind of a difficult term to get your head around, but it's basically anything that has an instance. So, uh, for example, a book, the copy of the book, let's say, I don't know, um, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, my copy of the book of Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five and your copy of the book of Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five are both individual things, but Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five is a universal. It's not an individual thing in and of itself as a book. The last thing is an individual thing cannot be an event or a process. So, as has been much often talked about, me hitting the bear with my truck and seeing a girl's tattoo is an event and process and not an individual thing. So. The question then comes from metaphysicians, how many individual things are there in the world? And there's several different ways of taking a look at that. Your nihilist, which is important to note that this is metaphysical nihilism and uh, not moral nihilism. But your nihilist is going to say there's zero. There are no individual things. We won't talk about that a lot because what I want to talk about is monism. So the monist is going to say that there's exactly one individual thing. And most monists are going to refer to this individual thing as the supreme being, the supreme mind, or the one. And then most common Western metaphysicians are going to say that there's more than one individual thing, and at the point in which you said there are more than one individual thing, there's not really too much of a distinction that needs to be made. If you're going to confess that there's more than one, you might as well just confess that there's multiple. Um, basic ideas of monism is that there is only one individual thing, and this one individual thing comprises all of reality. It comprises everything that we experience, everything that we see, feel, think, so on and so forth. But there's different ways in which that is interpreted. So the three kind of spin-offs or variations of monism are um, the Spinozian monism, which is the idea that things, the individual things that we appear to see in the world are actually just modifications of the one. So this whiteboard, marker, coronavirus, computer, so on and so forth, myself, are all modifications of the one that is, the supreme being. And so um, simple very similar to how a wrinkle in a carpet is not an individual, but simply a modification of the carpet. The uh, all the so what we think are individual things are just modifications of the one thing. Um, absolute idealism is more of a radical form of monism, which say that everything that we think that we perceive are simply illusions. There's actually only one thing or one supreme being, and Everything else that we seem to think are individual things are not. They're just illusions that we have or have been fed to us by the supreme being in some way. And the final uh, variation of monism is hidden monism, which is the idea that things are just the one in different guises. So they're actually, you could say that there's such a thing as a whiteboard, a computer, myself, and this pen or marker. But in actuality, those are just the one, the supreme mind adopting different guises and I guess kind of presenting himself to himself. So it's kind of like one of those weird uh, puppet shows. But anyway, so Spinoza, the theory, the kind of the strain of monism that I want to focus on very brief, wow, four minutes, very briefly, is um, Spinozian monism as absolute idealism and hidden monism are quite honestly just terrible. So Spinozian monism has been supported by two famous arguments by two different philosophers. Um, uh, Spinoza, who supposed that anything that could not be proved to be entirely independent of any other thing is the only definition of individuality. So for an individual thing to actually be an individual, Spinoza would add to our list up here, it had to be independent of anything else. Because as soon as you say that one thing is dependent upon another thing, 
then the thing dependent upon the first thing, let's say A is dependent on A prime, well, A isn't really an individual anymore. It could simply be said that A is a modification of A prime. And so Spinoza tracks that modification all the way back, and he says there's only one thing that's truly independent of all other things. Uh, and so there's a lot of kind of, I think there's a lot of vagueness in Spinoza's theory, although I think he's hitting upon an interesting principle that needs a lot more thought. But most metaphysicians kind of just um, push this aside and say, well, even if you have this causal process, you could still say that the, you know, an individual thing can create another individual thing that even though it's dependent upon uh, A prime, doesn't necessarily mean that A doesn't, isn't an individual in and of itself. The other argument is that Bradley attempts to show through uh, the relation of intrinsic and relational properties that it's actually impossible for there to be more than one individual. Uh, Bradley's argument is really just kind of contorted and vague and it's got a lot of really technical language and to be quite honest, most philosophers who do understand it or at least pretend to understand it, reject it. So we're not really going to talk about that a whole lot, but Bradley is tries to prove monism by showing that it's actually impossible for there to be uh, more than one thing. There can only be two individual things by nature of the relation of ourselves to other properties or other beings. And so uh, I'm not going to talk about that a lot, but so as to say that it's a complicated argument that most philosophers are just going to reject. But that would be... Um, sorry, let me put my notes real fast. That's going to be the what is metaphysical monism. So the next uh, topic I'm going to talk about, we'll turn my computer to switch just a little bit. Sit right here. And that slide out of the frame. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is move to temporality. And we're going to talk a little bit about not necessarily um, the argument over where time, whether time exists or not, which is a fascinating argument, but we're going to talk about what is the nature of time if it does exist. And so there's three different ideas for what the nature of time might be like if, in fact, it does exist. So these three theories are presentism, the growing block theory, and eternalism. So presentism is the idea that time is kind of just a sliver, and just in the sliver of the present is the only time or the only reality that actually exists. Anything that we would think of as being in the past is not existent, and anything that we think of as being in the future is also not existent. The only thing that actually exists is the present, right now, this moment. Now, the next theory, the Brown and Block theory, is the idea that the present and the past exist, but the future is still non-existent. So we kind of have like a growing block of time, up, 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 and so on and so forth, until the rapture. Uh, eternalism is the idea that past, present, and future all are existing at the same time, and we're just kind of moving on this scale of time. So, uh, for instance, Adam and Eve were alive at one time, maybe, could be, I don't know, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Christ, uh, life and death is at a time. I am sitting here talking to this computer at a time, and the rapture occurs at another time. And all of these are existent things. They're all events. There's all people involved. There's all um, realities that are true and are existent at that time, but spread out. It's, it's all existent at the same time, basically. So the theory of time that I want to talk about is presentism. So the idea... There it is. Okay, you can see that. The basic theory of presentism is that there are only such things that are now, with now being just a redundant adverb. Because basically the only things that are existent are things existent, or are things that are happening in a temporal sense right this very second. So for the presentist, really temporality is just in the extreme present right now. There's no really existent temporality in the past, there's no really existent temporality in the future. So this has led the presentist to create three kind of propositions that define presentism, or at least this is how Van Inwagen is going to um, attempt to define presentism. The first proposition is that only present objects exist, which, granted, okay, we can kind of talk about that a little later, but as we go into the next proposition, uh, we see that only present objects are real. But then the question is, well, what is the difference? What, what do we mean by real? And there's two ways you can take real. You can say, well, uh, this is a real pen considered to, I don't know, a fake pen. Or, you know, I'm a real person considered to a fake person, which I don't know what a fake person would look like. Maybe John MacArthur. But anyway, um, basically, the consideration is going to be, 
you know, we're not talking about that kind of real, obviously, because we're not talking about objects that aren't real objects. That wouldn't really make a lot of sense. So what we appear to be talking about is that objects that are existent objects, so we just have a restatement of premise one, only present objects exist. As I said, we'll come back to that in a sec. The last uh, proposition to define presentism is that everything is a present thing. So in a sort of what they're trying to say here is that everything that is existent is a present thing. And I think this is where presentism starts to fall apart a little bit because basically what the presentist is trying to get you to say, or at least trying to propose, is that anything that is must be right now. Anything that happened is in the past is not existent. Anything that happens in the present is not existent. But then the question comes, well, okay, let's take something that happened in the, or what we would think of as happening in the past. Let's say dinosaurs. Did dinosaurs exist? Well, the presentist will say, yes, dinosaurs did exist. We have um, evidence in the now, in the present, that you know we can find dinosaur bones in the Creation Museum from 6,000 years ago, and you know those exist. But what the presentist can't say is that there was a living, breathing dinosaur existing because everything that exists, everything that is an existent thing, is this a present existent object must be a present object. So for an object to actually have any sort of meaningful existence, it must be existent in the present. So statements like, you know, dinosaurs, there were dinosaurs, or Winston Churchill lived, or Christ died, um, all of those are events describing individuals, but the presentist has to say that you know those individuals don't aren't actually things or aren't included in everything because they're not present things. And I think that's where presentism really starts to break down. You can get into kind of the English of uh, that's what Van Eyckwagen does. He gets into the English of how do we break presentism down. But I think just that singular objection to uh, Proposition Three is enough to show that presentism has some pretty serious um, flaws. The next thing that I'm going to move on and talk about is this idea of objectivity. And so within objectivity, there are two kind of prevalent theories. One, realism, and then the other one, uh, anti-realism. So I'm going to try and give what I think is the best argument for anti-realism, uh, despite the fact that it kind of sucks. But uh, anyway, we'll get to it. So the problem of objectivity is how do we, you know, we say there may be individual things in the world, we say those individual things may be in temporal space, um, so on and so forth, but you know, what is the, do those individual things have properties or do those individual things have objective facts or propositions that are true about them independent of our um, perception of them? So the realist is gonna say that there are things that have objective facts or objective properties that are uh, true to those things uh, independent of any other things relation to them. So say uh, the famous mountain. We have this um, interesting mountain here that we say is 696,969.69 feet tall. So the a realist is going to say, well, that's the height of that mountain. And if no people had ever come upon that mountain and no one had ever reached the top of that mountain and no one had ever um, straddled the peak of that mountain, then there would still be the true fact that that mountain is 696,969.69 feet tall. There's nothing that you know we can do to change that objective fact of that mountain. The, the anti-realist has kind of a really interesting aspect they're going to take to this, uh, which I sum up here. So the anti-realist is going to say that the objectivity of the world is actually an illusion that's based on the cognitive interpretation. So, as all philosophers love to do, we've introduced an illusion of what we thought was uh, pretty true, and so now we have to ascertain what this is grounded in. The answer realist is gonna is gonna say that you know even even given the fact that this mountain may be six hundred ninety six thousand nine hundred sixty nine point six nine feet tall, without any the only the only way in which that fact is kind of communicated or expressed is through our understanding of that fact or our sensation of that experience of this mountain. So sure, this mountain might be there, but say there's no real way to say that it has the objective um, fact of being this tall because there's nothing there to call it that tall. There's nothing there to say that it's 696,969.65 feet tall. There's just no, um, there's no, without the, the, all of those facts about the world, these what we consider to be objective facts, 
are more or less the language or the sensations, the way that we kind of just arrange the world within our mental minds. And so we arrange it in such a way that it appears to be we're describing possibly objective features of the world, but those objective features of the world are meaningless if we're not there to describe them. Um, the problem with this um, argument for the answer realist is that even in that, A, the answer realist can't say that they actually think that there are, um, that they're right, objectively right, because they're saying there are no you know, objective right facts or propositions. So the anti realist at the very best is standing on uh, an indeterminate position. They don't actually, can actually prove one way or the other if they're right or wrong with any objective certainty. But on the other side of the thing is the anti realist because of that, can't say that you know, the mountain doesn't have objective facts. But what the anti realist is going to try and say is that the mountain's objective facts are only actually um, meaningful in the sense that we have ascribed um, language or we have described perception or we have described um, certain features to those facts. And so those facts might be there just like, say, the quantum field might be there, but the quantum field is entirely meaningless to me unless I have um, developed an algorithm to which interprets the quantum field or how the quantum field reacts. Um, overall, I think the answer realist is noting an interesting aspect of reality and maybe something that we should definitely keep in mind with as we're engaging in metaphysical conversation, but he's not really proposing any kind of, I don't really think he's proposing any kind of real view. More, he's just making an observation of uh, something that we should recognize, but shouldn't necessarily sway us from thinking that uh, the objective facts about the world are actually there. Uh, and then I guess the last um, aspect of my final is talking about uh, some of the stories, one of the stories that we've read for metaphysics. And I think my favorite story we've read so far has been 72 letters. And to pick a metaphysical aspect just from that story would be really difficult. But I think my favorite aspect of that story is the nature that Chang is um, prescribing into his world through the lexical features of the world. So whereas we would think of uh, our, as is entropy reigning in our world, basically unchecked unless we can you know, throw energy to fight this entropy, but even then, you know, it's, the world is always just kind of collapsing into disorder. Uh, in the world that Chang has created, there's this lexical um, kind of transcendent undergirding of reality, like the, the true reality is a lexical reality. It's a reality of words. It's a reality of language. And it's also a mysterious reality. And understanding the nature of that reality actually enables you to reverse entropy. So it actually enables you to, in some ways, initiate a resurrection type of power into the world. And so I think that's really interesting because I think what um, Chang is trying to do here is he's saying, you know, we, he's, he's putting what I actually think is a real aspect of our world into scientific principles because as uh, Western geniuses, we can't think of anything apparently outside of scientific principles. But what he's trying to do here, I think, is he's saying, you know, there's a transcendent aspect to our world. There's a spiritual aspect to our reality. And the only, the, the reason that we don't um, engage with that is because we can't think of it scientifically, but uh, there's, there's almost this, the divine, the transcendent aspect of reality is, is wants to engage in the world in a resurrectionary way. It wants to engage in the world in a restorative process. It wants to push back against these forces of chaos and entropy that are basically tearing apart the order of the world. And I think you see that, especially, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures, I think you see that in lots of spiritual scriptures where, uh, especially in the ancient world, where chaos has been brought together, it's been pulled together by a divine power, and then the, the war, the, the, the yin and yang, what's being pulling apart is the chaos attempting to rip this order back apart. And so what Chang is saying in his world is that the key to understanding a manner in which we can uh, engage in warfare against chaos or in which we can uh, undergird and reverse the chaotic impulses of the world is through language, it's through a lexicon, it's through uh, understanding the nature and the mystery of the transcendent that undergirds reality. And I think that's true in our world today. I think the Christian message is a call to 
access through language, through through concepts, through creativity, access this um, this transcendent nature that undergirds reality, that in many ways defines reality. And the goal of that transcendent nature is to restore reality. It's to um, bring about resurrection on earth. Now that might be in the manner in which we're in an eschatological manner in which we are called to adopt an apocalyptic uh, mindset of the world in which we're simply looking for the parousia, we're looking for the, to the return of the true power for that transcendent reality to express itself as imminent, to express itself as sensational reality. But I think, I actually, I think there's a manner in which you can, uh, by accessing that reality, through language, through concepts, you can initiate this reversal of entropy. You can initiate this restorative process that is against the chaos of the world in a spiritual sense, within a, within a human sense, within a uh, creative sense, within a communal or a relational sense, in which maybe the, the scientific aspect, it appears that, you know, we can't put it in a formula. We can't put it in a dictionary or we can't you know beat it with a hammer and nail it onto our house and keep out the wind but you can make the house a place you want to live in again you can put the tapestry up you can you know put the rug on the door you can hug your wife in bed and those things the the chaos that is attempting to impede upon those things is a chaos that we are called to fight against through access to this lexical, through access to this kind of undergirding reality that not only supersedes, but also runs alongside of the physical reality that we know so much about. So anyway, I've went gloriously over. I hope this doesn't bore you to death. If it does, uh, I'm sorry. Peace. Oh, if I die, also peace. <laughs>